Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today we have a, a really exciting, distinguished lecturer, uh, Shaki Weissman from uh, Stanford. And uh, Shaki's been around, he's been at Stanford for 14 years. Uh, and he's, he's done an awful lot of stuff. And, and he's been active in the Information Theory Society. He is an editor of the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory. And he's created the Stanford Data Compression Forum. He's active in the NSF Science of Information Center that's uh, at Purdue, but involves Stanford and, and many other universities. And uh, I, he's an IEEE fellow. He's won a number of best paper awards. And I noticed his students' dissertations win a number of awards and, and best paper awards. And uh, <clears throat> so I asked him if I could talk about this. And of course, he, he was also involved with the uh, TV series Silicon Valley which is uh, coming in his fourth season. And, and he says he can't take credit for getting them to talk about data compression, but, they, but he was an advisor on data compression uh, algorithms and that, and his former student, Venus Mishra, I guess, who's now at Netflix. So he was ruined and sent off to multimedia land. So, so uh, anyway, I, I'm uh, really excited to introduce you and, and join me in welcoming Shaki Weissman. Thank you so much uh, for this kind introduction um, and the invitation uh, and the hospitality and the weather that you provided. Amazing. And I don't know how you guys get anything, any work done <laughs> in this area. But um, So I do apologize for this uh, mouthful of a title. Uh, but it is an attempt to capture the two main themes uh, that I try to articulate in the, in the abstract. And uh, these themes are not new, uh, but I hope to show you some new angles on them. Uh, so one is that the characterization of fundamental limits in data compression and communication gives rise to quantities that are relevant for inference at large. Uh, and the second is that uh, analytic tools and algorithmic know-how from compression uh, can naturally be harnessed for inference in general. Okay, so these are the two themes that will be intertwined. Um, and I'll be talking about some both classical and recent results. Uh, so slightly more specifically, what I'm going to try to get through is um, telling you about information theoretic quantities, uh, their significance and properties, uh, and some recent result from my group on why mutual information matters so much. Um, and after I hopefully motivate you with that, we'll talk a little bit about some recent work from my group on estimation of mutual information and how you can apply uh, good estimators to some other problems of interest. Uh, then I'll introduce, I'll go back to introducing information theoretic quantities with uh, talking about directed information, which is a quantity I'll try to uh, motivate uh, is interesting in, for inference at large. And then I'll also ask, okay, how can we estimate it? And so then I'll, I'll go to something seemingly unrelated which is talk about universal compressors, which uh, we'll see induce in universal schemes for other things, like prediction and directed information uh, estimation and filtering, which is sort of causal denoising. Uh, and then hopefully with time, I'll also talk about a very recent line of work of how they induce, how compressors can induce sort of non-sequential uh, inference schemes, such as non-causal denoisers. Okay, and then um, hopefully you'll still be with me and we'll conclude. So, um, and I should maybe apologize or give a disclaimer. I will introduce some things, so we'll have some definitions and some results uh, and some examples, uh, both sort of toy examples and some on real data. Uh, but. I'm not going to have time for any proper account of literature. Um, the talk is going to be very biased, skewed toward my own interests and work. Um, 
sometimes I'll talk about results without giving you all the uh, conditions. Uh, and I'll have no time for proofs or proof ideas. But I will, in the end, refer you to the papers that will hopefully address uh, all of these um, drawbacks. So, OK, um, what are we going to be looking at initially? Uh, the entropy of a random object, a discrete random object, x, right, is the sum over all the values that this object can take uh, of the probability of these values, log 1 over their probability. Okay? Relative entropy between two distributions is the log of the likelihood between p and q averaged with respect to p. And mutual information is the, this same relative entropy between the joint law, the, the mutual information between a pair of arbitrarily jointly distributed objects, random objects, u and v, is the relative entropy between their joint law and the product of their marginals. I know that probably for all of you this is not new, but just in case. Um, and these guys also have conditional versions, right? So if we write something, if I write h of x given y, I mean the entropy associated with the distribution on x given a particular value of y, as we defined in the previous slide, averaged with respect to the randomness in y. Um, relative, conditional relative entropy. So, you know, I'll write the relative entropy between the conditional on x given y under p and the conditional on x given y under q. Okay, and this is average with respect to the randomness in y according to p. So that's just this notation. And mutual information between u and v conditioned on w. Again, so mutual information as we defined it in the previous slide associated with the joint distribution on u, v given some particular value for w averaged over the randomness in w. And one of the reasons we like these uh, quantities, right, as again, essentially all of you I'm sure know, is that they are easy to manipulate. Uh, they satisfy all sorts of chain rules. So for example, the entropy of the pair xy is the entropy of x plus the conditional uh, entropy of y given x. The relative entropy between p of, on xy and q on xy is the relative entropy between the marginals on x plus the conditional relative entropy between the conditionals on y given x. Okay, and this, if you uh, apply uh, this uh, identity to the definition of mutual information, which we'll, we'll recall is the relative entropy between the joint law and the product of the marginals, you'll get, for example, this representation of a relative entropy between the conditional on y given x and the unconditional on y. Average with respect to x is one, um, is one way of expressing the mutual information. And um, so, okay, let's talk about why initially in information theory we cared about these quantities. Well, okay, entropy, I won't salt your intelligence. We all know that's the fundam fundamental limit on how well you can compress uh, your data, right, in terms of the number of bits per source symbol if the data is distributed according to x uh, for lossless compression, right? What about relative entropy? Well, among other reasons we like it so much is that it, uh, it's the cost of mismatch in compression, right? It's the, the cost in excess number of bits in, when you optimize your source, your, your compressor for distribution Q when the uh, true source is distributed according to P. Uh, in the context of large deviations, right? If you generate your data according to Q, right, how likely is it that the data look as if it was generated by P? It's exponentially unlikely, right, with this being the exponent. And, um, and I should also mention that it's a very natural measure of discrepancy between distributions. And in a sense, it's a stronger measure. It's a more harsh measure of discrepancy in that, among other things, it satisfies the Pinsker's inequality, right? which basically says that it's harder to be close 
for P and Q to be close under relative entropy is harder than to be close under, say, total variation distance. Okay, and it's something I'll, I'll get back to. So uh, that was relative entropy. What about mutual information? Why do information theorists like mutual information so much? Because, again, as many of you know, it emerges as the answer to many of our questions in data compression and communication, right? Many of you know the maximal rate of reliable communication through a channel is the maximum mutual information between the input and output uh, that you can get across this channel, right? Maximize overall input distributions, um, for example. And also, it has lots of cool properties like uh, chain rules that make it um, sort of you know, easy and convenient to manipulate. Uh, but that's why information theorists like mutual information so much. Um, but why do other people uh, from other fields use it so extensively? So towards that, uh, this sort of, um, so again, one thing is that it has all sorts of uh, properties that are, are natural in many applications, right? Um, so, you know, by its definition, sort of it's a natural measure of the dependence between x and y, right? The, the discrepancy between the joint distribution and the distribution under which they would have been independent, um, right? It's commutative. Um, you know, it doesn't care about the order of the arguments. It's invariant to one-to-one -one transformations of the arguments. So again, in many applications these days in big data, the way in which you choose to you know, label the data is immaterial. If it's a zero or one or A or B or like or dislike, it's the same content. Uh, and you don't want your measure of dependence to, uh, to be affected by the arbitrary way in which you label the data. And as I said, it, it, it satisfies all sorts of, of chain rules that make it convenient to manipulate. So, okay, so these are nice properties to have, but in fact, this is not the only measure of dependence to have these properties. So why still is mutual information so widely used across so many fields? Um, so toward addressing this question, let me ask you um, the following. So you have X and Y jointly distributed, and you want to know um, how relevant is Y for X, okay, for inference on X. Um, okay, so how can we try to quantify this? Well, one natural way is to is for you to tell me, you know, what is the loss function that you care about? Give me your sort of concrete way in which you want to quantify relevance through some loss function, and I will define a so-called coherence dependency function that dates back at least as, as early as '98 to Dawid, uh, and I'll define it to be sort of the best inference that you could do on x in the absence of y, okay, versus the best inference that you could do on x when you have y, okay, under this loss function that you gave me. And this in itself is uh, already a sort of, you might argue, a, ma a natural measure for the relevance of y for x. Um, it, among other things, you know, it's obviously non-negative and it has this desirable property that if y tilde is sort of a degraded or corrupted version of y with respect to x, then this quantity that we've defined is uh, going to, to decrease, right? y tilde is less relevant for inference on x than, uh, than y, okay? On the other hand, um, for a general loss function, this sort of quantity that we defined is not going to satisfy one thing that I think we agreed we want in many applications, which is, say, invariance to the way in which you choose to label the data. Uh, if you, for example, gave me as your loss function of interest squared error, then it's very easy to see that uh, transformations of x, one-to-one -one transformations of x, will, can, can result in very different uh, values for this measure of relevance. Okay? And again, in many applications, 
where the labeling is immaterial, you definitely don't want your measure of dependence to be affected by the, such transformations. So, um, okay, so one thing I hope we can agree uh, is a very natural and sensible requirement of a measure of dependence is to be, again, to have this sort of invariance of one-to-one -one transformations, say, of x. Okay? And here I'm going to, um, to in fact, um, require something much more modest, which is sort of invariance um, or in, of this measure of dependence to very specific one-to-one -one transformations of x, ones that are, in, in fact, not, um, yes, so ones that are, um, that form a sufficient statistic of x. Okay, so, um, so in fact, what I, okay, sorry, let me, let me um, go back and say, definitely what we, what I think we can agree is that um, we want this measure of relevance to be, to be uh, decreasing if you, you look at the relevance of y to a transformation of x okay, in general. And, um, and suppose that I'm going to require something even more basic, uh, which is that this measure of relevance is decreasing only for a subset of such trans of transformations, ones uh, for which, ones that are sufficient statistic of x for y. Okay, so it's a very, very small subset of the possible transformations that you can do on x. Um, it turns out that under this very natural and modest requirement, in fact, um, the only loss function that you can give me for measuring relevance would be the so-called logarithmic loss function. Okay? And the only resulting measure of relevance would be mutual information. Okay, sorry for this, uh, this being cut. This is mutual information. Okay, so, um, so I guess the point here that I'm, uh, that this result is, uh, is bringing out is that mutual information, not only does it satisfy all these nice, cool properties, but in fact, it's the only measure of relevance, of statistical dependence to satisfy this sort of very basic and, and natural requirement that you would want to have of a measure of dependence. And this sort of largely, uh, I believe, justifies and explains the wide use of mutual information all over the place. Uh, and again, not only in information theory, in, in, in neuroscience, biology, genomics, um, finance, uh, whenever people want to measure statistical dependence, statistical relevance, they end up using mutual information. And why? Because, excuse my French, uh, it's basically the only measure that doesn't suck in the sense that uh, it satisfies this very basic thing that you obviously want in practice. Uh, and I should say, I mean, this, uh, this sort of recent result is different from a multitude of other axiomatic characterizations that are beautifully uh, summarized in a recent work by Chizar, where usually it's about, okay, we all know all these wonderful properties of mutual information. Let's assume some of them and then show that mutual information is the only one to satisfy them. Here, it's sort of, it's a different, it's a different angle. It's let's, let's require something very, very basic. And already we're seeing that uh, mutual information is the only measure to satisfy it. So now that hopefully I've uh, sort of motivated why you should care about the mutual information between quantities that you care about, um, let's talk a little bit about how you can estimate it in practice. Um, so I'm going to look at a very uh, simple problem. Let's, let's in fact even start with estimating entropy. So let's say that, oops, sorry, what you have is data coming, IID from a an unknown distribution P uh, over an alphabet of size S, which may or may not be known. And um, 
you want to estimate the entropy right, of this distribution. One very natural thing to do is to just look at the empirical distribution, the empirical frequency of the appearances of the different things that you see, and shove that empirical distribution into the entropy functional. Right? And that's the so-called empirical entropy, which is also, for this case, it's a maximum likelihood estimator. Again, many of you know this. Um, and so how good is that, right? Well, the, 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 or one natural measure of goodness here is to say, OK, let's look at the mean square error of this estimator, right? Worst case over all the possible distributions. Right? Uh, so let's look at, so this is our performance uh, criterion. Right? So let's look at this, this worst case MSE uh, associated with the empirical entropy <coughs> versus the best. Okay? So the worst case MSE um, you know, optimized over all the estimators in the world. Okay? This is the so-called minimax quantity, which depends, of course, on the size of the alphabet and n, the number of observations. OK? So everyone with me? Uh, OK, so how well does empirical entropy perform? Um, well, classically, uh, the classical regime is one of fixed alphabet size and large number of observations. This is uh, sort of classical results in uh, estimation theory, hayek lecamp theory, will tell you that this worst case MSE achieved by the empirical entropy estimator is of order log squared size the alphabet over n. In fact, this is also exact, the exact constant, right? And, and in fact, this is the optimum. So any, any estimator in the world will do no better than that, right? Again, those of you who've taken uh, signal estimation, uh, 101, right, will be familiar with this sort of a result. Um, okay, so perhaps guided by this, let's do an experiment. Let's um, take an alphabet size, uh, say 10,000, okay, with 1,000 observations, okay, uh, and let's and we're let's randomly select sort of from the simplex of distributions on this alphabet uh, distribution. So we did that, and we got some uh, distribution whose entropy happens to be 9.2 something. Right? Now, if you look at this and guided by this, you'd say, OK, we, we should be fine, because log squared of s is 81. Number of observations is 1,000. So we should be at about, what, 8% MSE. Um, but when we did the um, experiment, and we, d we used this empirical entropy estimator, and average over many experiments, we got a square error, which is very large, 5.6, right? Average over many experiments and so on. So, OK, what's the problem? Excuse me? Um, Right, but still, you you expect that if you know if this sort of if this thing is in expectation should be about eight percent, you average this over many experiments, you expect to get about eight percent error, not something like five point six. Um, right, exactly, and and the the point is that again, this is in a regime of fixed the classical regime, or, uh, on which all statistics have been based until about a decade ago of fixed s, large n. However, here, we're definitely not in a regime of s small relative to n. Okay? So, um, right, so the, the uh, maximum likelihood estimator, and in this case, the empirical entropy estimator, it works for n much larger than s. Um, and so to explain this, what we did in a recent work was dig deeper into the uh, the worst case MSC of the empirical entropy. And what you find is that it, it has you know, the bias, as usual, right? There's a bias in the various term. The bias term is log squared s over n. Uh, sorry, the variance term is log squared s over n. The bi there's also a bias term, which is this s squared over n squared. Okay? In the classical regime, 
uh, the leading term is this sort of 1 over n term. But in a regime of s comparable and maybe even larger than n, uh, the bias tends to dominate. And so um, um, OK, so this is what happens. And this sort of also explains something that was observed not too long ago, that empirical entropy is OK even in regimes of s growing with n, but as long as s is sort of no more than linear in n. The size of the alphabet is essentially comparable to the number of observations. Um, that's sort of the phase transition between being able to estimate the entropy um, consistently and not being able to do it with the empirical entropy estimator. What about the minimax estimator, the best that you can do? Um, well, it turns out that um, you have a very similar expression. So this is the expression from the previous slide. Uh, it's just that here in the denominator for the bias term, n is replaced by n log n. Okay, so that basically is the optimal uh, behavior that you can get if you're using the opt essentially the optimal scheme, the minimax optimal scheme. Um, in particular, it implies, or something that was observed relatively recently, is that in fact you can get you can estimate the entropy consistently even if the number of observations is less sublinear in the size of the alphabet. Okay? As long as it's of order size of the alphabet over log size of the alphabet. Okay? But this gives you a very precise and crisp characterization and also understanding of where the action is, which is really in this sort of bias term. Um, OK, and you know, this sort of a methodology works for uh, functionals other than entropy. Um, anything, any functional of the distribution, essentially of this form, we, uh, we can get, we can characterize the minimax quantity and give a scheme, a uh, practical, sort of implementable scheme that achieves it. Uh, so this is in, in this paper. Um, I'll give you more details in the end. Um, let me now use it. So recall, our, one of the motivations is to estimate neutral information. So how can we now take, now that we have a way of estimating, say, entropy, how can we use it for estimating neutral information? Right? Well, one of, the, one of the ways to express neutral information from the chain rules is as the entropy of x plus the entropy of y minus the joint entropy. Right? But we have now a good sound way of estimating entropy. Right? So let's try to estimate each one of these guys separately using our good minimax estimators. Uh, it will probably not surprise you to learn that the resulting scheme is a sort of a minimax optimal estimator for mutual information. And, um, OK, so let's try to see um, what it gives you and what benefits uh, this gives you in practice. Right? So on the face of it, you say, OK, it's just a log n factor. Who cares? Uh, but in fact, a log n factor in the effective number of samples that you have. Right? Instead of n, now we have n log n. So it's essentially a sample size enlargement that you, that you get by slightly or tweaking your, your estimators. What does that buy you in practice? Um, well, let me give you one, one example of learning a tree model. So let's suppose um, that you have a d-dimensional uh, random vector. And you, you're assuming that it comes from uh, a distribution that can be factored as a tree. Okay, so it has a graphical representation of a tree, but you don't know what tree. Um, and the idea is to get IID samples from this X and discover the tree. Okay, so this is a very uh, well-known and sort of basic uh, problem in, in machine learning. And um, there's the so-called Chao-Liu algorithm, which people use all over the place, many of you know. 
uh, which is to basically uh, do the following. Um, estimate as, as your tree the maximal weight spanning tree where the weights are the empirical mutual informations between the relevant nodes. Okay? Uh, so that's the so-called Chao Leo algorithm, and it's, uh, you know, you can do this sort of computationally, efficiently, uh, you know, to find the maximal weight spanning tree. And people use that as a way of, of estimating uh, and detecting the tree. Uh, and what do we suggest to do? Well, okay, so one thing that um, I'll, I'll give you as a motivation for what we're doing is that if you want to understand why this works so well, um, you can actually, it's not a hard exercise to show that if you knew the true distribution, okay, the true tree would be the maximal weight spanning tree when the weight would be the true mutual information. Okay? So once you do this exercise, you realize that this is nothing but an attempt to sort of estimate the true unknown mutual informations between the, the relevant nodes with the empirical mutual information. Okay. So what we're su suggesting is now to replace, to do maximal weight spanning tree, but to replace the empirical mutual information between the nodes with our better estimates of the mutual information. So when you do that, so here's uh, one uh, experiment that we did. We took uh, you know, D equals seven nodes, alphabet size of 300, uh, a star graph, so, so the, the, the ground truth is, is a star graph, and we, uh, we sweep n, the number of observations, from say one to 55k, and this is what uh, the Chao Liu algorithm gives. So on the y-axis is essentially the fraction of correct edges uh, that the Chao Liu algorithm outputs. And you'll see the sort of phase transition where, you know, before you have sufficiently many observations, you, um, you basically get everything wrong. But then at some point you have sufficiently many observations, uh, which you can think of it perhaps given the previous slide, as sufficiently many observations so that these empirical mutual informations are close enough to the true mutual informations so that the resulting output is the true tree, and then you get it perfectly. Okay? And in practice, people use this all over the place, and basically, I mean, you don't know the ground truth in practice, so basically you employ it, and you kind of pray that you're in this regime. Uh, so now what happens if we replace these, mutual these empirical mutual informations with our estimators? Uh, for this example, this is where the, the phase transition happens. Uh, so basically, sort of at an order of magnitude less observations. Okay? You already get the true tree. So this you can use. Um, so if I had more time, I would show, it how you, I would show you how you can use it in the context of classification. Um, I think I'm, um, I don't think I have time to, I don't want to spend more time, but many of you know in machine learning, there are many applications in the classification and in, uh, in image querying where this uh, sort of learning of a tree structure is a building block uh, for doing all sorts of things. And in those cases, we can provide you with boosts uh, in the performance. So that's really my simple message in this part of the talk, uh, that you can do better than empirical mutual information. And in fact, if any of you want to use this in your applications, we recently have a code release. So feel free to it use it. Uh, right, so, so as I said in the disclaimer, we don't have time for proofs or proof ideas. However, but, but because you're asking, um, and I deliberated whether to give some slide of a rough idea, but very roughly the idea is that in these regimes of large alphabet and, uh, and relatively small number of observations, uh, and what's killing you is the bias term. And this bias term is killing you uh, particularly at places of these functionals, 
uh, these functionals of the distributions that again are very sensitive to small changes. For example, in the context of entropy, it's at small, small p's. The this functional is very sensitive. So very roughly, the idea is that instead of targeting this functional directly, you um, you you take a polynomial approximation of this functional. And which is easier to estimate in, a, in an unbiased or, or small bias way. And then it's, it's sort of the art of juggling between the goodness, you know, sort of how, how good you approximate. So sort of the, the better the approximation, the closer you are to the original functional, but the higher it is to, to estimate and the higher the variance. So it's sort of finding the sweet spot. Um, Right. So in fact, in the case of the entropy functional, uh, do, that is slightly too crude. Uh, but so what you actually end up having to do again is in those areas of small p, estimate the, the entropy functional with a low order polynomial. And that does it. Yes, yes. It's, um, so there, there's one sort of stage, uh, and it relates to my, my answer um, to your question, of uh, doing these actual, po these polynomial approximations. They take some time, but it's something you do at once, offline. It has to do only with the functional you're trying to estimate. And once you've done that, uh, it's totally comparable to empirical mutual information. It's only about computing these empirical distributions. Actually, good question. Uh, no, it, so our scheme that achieves, that we show achieves, so the minimax quantity depends on the alphabet size, but our scheme which achieves it need not know the alphabet. Well, I want to make an announcement now. We're, we're, we're recording this, and so we could capture questions on the microphone. So. Okay, or I'll try to repeat the question. Sure, okay. Okay, um, great. So this is in the context of mutual information estimation, um, which we'll get to. But speaking of mutual information, uh, let me get to another quantity that may interest some of you, the so-called directed information between, uh, so x superscript n is a sequence or, or process, x1 up to xn. This is y1 up to yn. Uh, the directed information from xn to yn is defined as the sum of mutual information between x up to i and y at time i given the past of y. Okay? If you compare it to mutual information, or one way of expressing mutual information, as many of you know, using again these chain rules, is as a sum of these mutual informations. Okay? So the only difference here is that direct information, here you have x only up to time i. And here you have the whole x sequence in mutual information, okay? Now, why is this a quantity of interest? Well, again, some of you know that it arises very natural in the context of communication. In fact, it's even more fundamental in the sense to communication than mutual information because the capacity for a very wide set of channels and you know, with or without feedback is given as a limb of a max over directed information. Uh, and you know what? If it's without feedback, you can you maximize over certain sets of distributions. In which case, it, it collapses to the well-known mutual information expression that many of you know from Gallagher. Uh, in the presence of feedback, it's an optimization over another set. But this is really the fundamental quantity in communication. Um, but why should any of you who don't care about communication care about it, well, let's, let's try to think of, say, an inference setting where you have two phenomena of interest. Uh, and let's say, just for simplicity, that there's sort of an ordering of, of time of, OK, first it's x1, then you see y1, then x2, then y2, then x3, then y3. OK? So, right. Right. Um, so, so let's try to think of you know, what's captured, say, by such a mutual information, right? Let's suppose you're interested in doing inference on the Y process. So let's suppose that you've seen the past of the Y process and you want to do inference on the next Y component, Y at time I, right? Uh, 
I want to know to what extent is everything that happened with the X process so far relevant for this sort of inference, right? But hey, I just convinced you that we have a great, the ultimate measure of relevance in statistical inference, right, which is the mutual information, right? So this is the sort of canonical measure of the extent to which everything that happened so far with the X process is relevant for inference on y, given the past of y. Okay, so to what extent is this x process, sort of in a causal fashion, relevant when I try to do inference on y? Okay, um, and of course, if you sum, and similarly, right? If you look at, um, you know, if I do, I want to do inference on x. I want uh, to, to infer x, say, a time i, given its past, to what, how relevant is everything that happened with the y process so far, right? So that's very naturally measured by this mutual information, right? And when you sum these up, right, these guys, they sum up, they give the directed information. These guys, they give also the directed information between the sort of y sequence shifted by 1. So I denote it by y, oops. Sorry. By y to the n minus 1 to the x process. Okay, and one nice thing that you can show, in fact, very easily, again, exercise for any of you using these basic chain rules that I flashed at you in the beginning of the talk, uh, that for any joint distribution of these guys, you always have this identity that the, the mutual information is the sum of the directed information from x to y and the directed information from y, from this shifted y to x. Okay, so sort of qualitatively, you can think of this as, okay, mutual information, we all know it's the measure of, right, relevance or dependence between x and y, right? And this decomposes it very naturally into, right, the extent to which x is sort of causally relevant for the formation or evolution or inference on y and the extent to which y is responsible sort of causally for x, okay? And so in many contexts, uh, this directed information is, again, a very natural measure of sort of causal relevance. And, um, and so one thing you may want to derive our estimators, our ways of estimating, for example, something called the directed information rate, which is the limit of these sort of this normalized directed information in the context of, you know, increasing time, uh, assuming, let's say for concreteness, station, joint stationarity of these phenomena, and say finite alphabets, okay? So, um, so Toward that, so with this as one of our motivations, let me shift to something seemingly unrelated and talk about um, lossless compression. Right? So many of you know that um, lossless compression is um, sort of, in fact, equivalent to um, any lossless scheme, whether it wants to or not, right, induces a a, prob a model or a distribution on the data that it's trying to compress, right? Many of you know this. Uh, and of course, once you have a, a distribution, a probability on the data, there's also an equivalent represented in, in terms of sequential probability assignment of, you know, the distribution of one data component given, say, the past data component, right? So, and accordingly, also then, if you have a universal compressor, right? Uh, it induces universal probability assignments uh, and universal sequential probability assignments, right? And what does this mean, this universality, right? More concretely, if you'll recall that relative entropy is the measure of discrepancy uh, sort of between your, uh, it's sort of relative entropy measure essentially how far you are from the optimum, the entropy, right? So in fact, the um, sort of the existence of universal compressors is equivalent to the existence of distributions Q, okay, with the property that uh, the normalized relative entropy between the true distribution of the data and 
uh, its distribution under Q is vanishing. Okay? And say universality with respect to all stationary processes means that this thing is vanishing for all stationary sources. Okay? And when you look at it um, initially, I mean, it's lo it looks very um, striking that there would even be such Qs, right, that sort of are simultaneously close under this very harsh measure of discrepancy, relative entropy, to you know, this very, very large class of, of processes, all stationary processes. But again, by now, we've, taken, we've grown to take it for granted because we all know uh, that there exist universal compressors, right? The length of Z, context tree weighting, and in fact, they, they even have all sorts of nice computational properties. They're very natural uh, and graceful to implement, and, and CTW even has great rates of convergence, and so on. So, um, so now the thing that you can do is um, also use these compressors and these universal, these sequential probability assignments uh, that they induce for other problems, other sequential inference tasks, such as, uh, say, prediction, right? So you can, you can show that if you assume, if you take this such a, a Q, right, any distribution on the data, you do prediction, you do optimal prediction with respect to some given loss function, uh, prediction that would be optimal had the data been distributed Q. Okay? And you compare that to the optimal prediction, the, the optimal predictor according to the true law of the data, which is P. Okay? So it's a pretty, um, again, not a very hard exercise to show that the difference between these performances is upper bounded in terms of something that becomes small when the normalized relative entropy between the true law and the law under Q is small. Okay? And so in particular, what this implies is that if you were to do sequential prediction under the sequential probability assignment induced by a universal compressor, what you will get is a, um, is a universal predictor, okay? a predictor that, whose performance in the limit of large n achieves the optimum, the Bayes optimal uh, prediction performance. Now similarly, okay, now um, we can use this also for directed information. So in direct information, recall it's the sum of these terms, uh, which one way of, of presenting it, if you'll recall uh, mutual information in terms of relative entropy, it's in terms of this sort of relative entropy between the distribution on yi given x up to i and the past of y, and the distribution on yi given just the past of y, average with respect to everything that we're conditioning on. And so you're saying, okay, now I want to estimate these guys. In practice, I don't know the true P. Okay. Well, something natural you can try to do is, instead of these true P's, use a universal Q. So you can use, you can take your favorite universal Q, apply it, in this case, you apply it once on the, uh, on the sequence of pairs, and that'll give you sort of a conditional on the next pair, X i y i given the past, and from this you can sort of manipulate it to get the, the posterior on y i given x at i, and the past of the joint process. Uh, so this, this is the queue that's sitting here. Here you, you similarly run a queue, a universal queue only on the, on the y process, and then you stick these distributions into the relative entropy functional, and this is one way, one natural way to construct in an estimator for the directed information. Um, and then there are variations on this, on this that we don't have the time to go through. I won't go through the theorems that tell you that the resulting directed information estimator is, is great, it, uh, it's consistent, and, and has all the, the best rates of convergence that you can hope for. Uh, this is on simulated data. Let me quickly flash uh, a sort of real data experiment at you. Um, so this is the Hang Seng Index versus the Dow Jones. Okay, so we, we took, this was available at, at Yahoo website. Um, these are the two um, sort of signals, Hang Seng and the Dow Jones. Uh, 
Hang Seng in red, Dow Jones in blue, plotted here on a daily basis from 1990 to 2011. So you look at this, you obviously see sort of correlation, uh, but what you perhaps want to know is to what extent is one in is one sort of driving the other? Which one here is sort of the one leading, and which one is the is is sort of following? Which one is the driver versus the follower? So um, again, if I convinced you that these directed information quantities are sort of a natural measure of these quantities, um, here's what happens when you employ the estimator that I showed you and also in a slight variation of it uh, on this real data. Basically what you see, um, so the red is our estimate of the directed information from, uh, from Hang, Hang Seng to Dow Jones. Uh, this is our estimate of the directed information from Dow Jones to Hang Seng. Okay, and their sum is the overall estimate of the mutual information. Um, and so sort of consistently with, with both of the estimators, what you see is that at least from 1990 to 2011, it was really uh, the Dow Jones that was affecting and driving the Hang Seng uh, rather than the other way around. Um, and I'm, I'm not putting my money that this will continue to be the trend in the next 20 years. Uh, but, okay, just an example. Um, now, I should, you know, time flies when you're having fun, yeah, so yeah. I should. Yeah, when you started five minutes late, at least, that's how we asked it. Five minutes, ten more minutes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so you can also do something similar with, um, uh, or you can also talk about um, sort of filtering or causal estimation or causal denoising. Um, here too, it won't surprise you. To, this is also sort of a sequential decision making problem. And you can develop similar bounds that show that if you do filtering, okay, so causal estimation. So, sorry, so I should say uh, X here is something of, you know, the, the underlying clean phenomenon of interest of an unknown distribution, and it's going through. Uh, let's say, a, a, a discrete memoryless channel. And what you observe is the Z process. You can do um, sort of, the, you give me Q, which is a distribution on the noisy data, on the noisy signal Z. And I will, uh, I will get, this is my best estimate of X at time T, given the noisy observation up to time T, if the noisy data is distributed Q, okay? Because we know the noise characteristics, if we know the distribution of the noisy data, we know what is the best uh, estimate of the underlying clean uh, sequence component. And again, th this would be the, op this is the optimal filter, okay, for the distribution of the data if it had been known. Um, and you can show, again, that uh, the difference between these can be bounded in terms of something which is small if the normalized relative entropy between the true distribution of the noisy data and the distribution under your Q that you're using is small. So again, if you do filtering, on, if you, have, you, you give me your favorite sort of universal data compressor and you see the sequential probabilities that it induces, such as in context-free weighting, these are very easy to compute. Um, you do your causal denoising with this sequential probability assignment, you'll be achieving the optimum, Bayes' optimal filtering performance. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to connect it to maybe the very last thing that I'll try to quickly mention, um, is that so far we looked at um, how universal uh, compressors, right, they induce universal sequential probability assignments that are very natural to employ for sequential problems, sequential decision-making problems like prediction, estimation, prediction, you know, estimation of directed information, filtering. Uh, what, I, what we haven't seen uh, done is, is use uh, 
such universal cues for non-sequential decision making, such as the denoising problem. Right? So if you think of the same setting of an unknown x corrupted by, say, a DMC to get uh, your noisy observation z, suppose that this time you're doing non-causal denoising. Right? So you want your best estimate of xt, assuming that the distribution of the noisy data is q, but based on all of the noisy data. Okay? Uh, well, here you can also you can bound the difference between the performance of this denoiser and the optimal denoiser in terms of something which replaces the relative entropy in the, in the, in the slide on causal denoising with something that we, we call, for historical reasons I won't get into, eraser relative entropy, which is the sum of relative entropies between the distribution on the true distribution on z at t, so the sum over all t's, zt given all the rest of the z's, and the distribution onto q of zt given the rest of the z's averaged over p. Okay. And you can compare this to the usual relative entropy, which, if you'll recall our chain rules, can be decomposed in the same way, only you look at the distributions on zt given the past. Okay? So that's the difference between the normal relative entropy and this new creature. And one question that you can ask then is, what about universality in this sense, right? So basically, um, motivated by this bound, what this suggests is that if I have a Q, which I know, for which I know this thing is going to be small for, let's say, all stationary Ps, then I know that the denoiser it induces is going to be a universal denoiser, right? It's going to achieve the optimum denoising performance. And, um, okay, so what about universality in the sense of this uh, thing? And, and more concretely, so we're going to say that Q is double-sided universal, right, because of the double-sided conditioning if this normalized new sort of eraser relative entropy is vanishing for every stationary p. Okay. So I know I'm out of time. Uh, the very natural questions that arise here, I mean, does there even, do there even exist such cues? Um, if I have a universal cue in the usual sense, does it induce cues that are universal in this sense? And so in particular, if I know I have a good universal compressor, will it induce a universal denoiser? Um, and do there exist, and, and in particular, perhaps some of the celebrated ones, LZ, CTW, and so on, do they induce universal denoisers? Um, and even if they do, can we compute the resulting denoisers in a um, sort of algorithmically uh, graceful manner? So let me quickly just flash at you some of the um, Punchlines, so yes, there do exist universal cues in this sense, but unfortunately, not any universal cue induces something which is universal in the sense that we need. Um, on the other hand, there do exist cues that are both universal and universal in the sense that we need, and in fact, uh, it turns out that CTW, which again, many of you know and perhaps uh, use and it's very graceful to implement and so on, CTW is, has that property, and CTW, in fact, even has um, sort of great rates of convergence, also under this new sort of measure of discrepancy that we need. So, uh, and even uh, the computation. So under CTW, computing the optimal denoiser, which would boil down to the posterior on XT, given all the noisy data. So even though the CTW is very natural, naturally uh, computed for the sequential probability assignments, you can be resourceful about computing these posteriors with O of 1 operations. And so the overall resulting denoiser is linear complexity in the size of your data. And so I'll quickly tell you that you, know, you can try to use this for text correction. And you do quite well and, uh, in fact, much better than 
current state of the art in, for some problems. I know I'm just going very quickly through this. Let me skip this. Let me just quickly say that uh, now we're, we're employing this in the context of uh, genomic data. Uh, some of you may know the assembly problem, which is to take uh, many noisy reads from the genome and use them to, to construct the underlying uh, genome. So what we've done is take these uh, noisy reads and employ the denoiser induced by CTW on them and then shove these sort of denoise reads into the same assemblers. Uh, and what we're getting, and this is very preliminary, so keep it between us, but we're getting boosts in the, um, in sort of the precision of the reconstructed uh, genome. But I will tell you where you can read more on this. Uh, so, okay, so I told you what the answers are. I guess uh, to recap, my main points were that characterizing fundamental limits in data compression and communication uh, give rise to quantities that are, should be of relevance and interest to inference at large, and that analytic tools uh, and algorithms from compression can be naturally harnessed uh, for general sequential inference tasks which is relatively old news. Uh, but uh, perhaps one sort of new component in this talk uh, is, and this we haven't even yet published, uh, but submitted, uh, is also for non-sequential inference, such as denoising. Um, and I should say that here, you know, I was, I was trying to be relatively concrete and specific, so I talked about how losses compression can be harnessed in all sorts of way for, ways for inference at large. There can be a whole other talk about ways in which lossy compression can be harnessed for uh, things like, um, you know, signal denoising. Um, but perhaps uh, this is something that Professor Gibson can uh, tell you about in some of his lectures. Uh, and I guess my bigger point is that um, theoretical tools and algorithms Algorithmic know-how uh, can and should be transferred from their original domains, uh, from my view, in compression and communication to inference at large. Um, I'll make the slides available so you can get all the refs of the main results that I mentioned here from my group, and in them you can find the more general uh, literature of relevance. Uh, and I should say that the main contributors uh, and who inspired much of the work here and, and did much of it uh, is, is Tom uh, Kurtade, who's currently on the faculty at Berkeley, uh, Yan Jun, who's currently a PhD student uh, in my group, Jian Tao, another very senior PhD student, Idoya, who is now in Urbana-Champaign, uh, the faculty, and Kaltik, whom we re who recently graduated and we lost to Wall Street. He's in a hedge fund and he's not, he's not telling us any details because he said he would have to kill us, but he did uh, allude to the fact that he in fact is using uh, some of the things that I mentioned, such as directed information estimation uh, in his uh, work in the hedge fund and probably in a rather lucrative fashion. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Right, right. Uh, very good question. Um, so, in, in fact, the, the one uh, sort of quick application example I've shown you on financial data, that's essentially continuous valued. And what we've done there was uh, sort of the brute force thing that you might think, which is to just quantize um, and to employ this, these directed information estimators on the sort of finite alphabet, effective finite alphabet quantized uh, symbols. Uh, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Um, in the context of just the mutual information estimation, so two, that you can, and in, in fact there are results 
showing that under some assumptions on, say you have X, X, Y, I, I, D, according to some joint density, under relatively benign assumptions on the joint density, you can show that this approach of quantizing and then sticking the finite alphabet quantized versions into our new estimators uh, will give you something which is essentially minimax. Uh, but of course, then, you know, in practice, of course, there's the whole art of, okay, you know, where to quantize and to what level and so on. Um, but m more generally, um, it, it is an interesting, and as far as I'm aware, largely open question for, you know, for general, you know, classes of, of distributions, uh, what's, what's the right thing to do? Um, I agree. Right. Um, you're right. So I guess that, so. There are two issues here. One is, you know, that that quantizing uh, loses information, and, and that is that is true. And here we sort of, you know, we need to juggle between, you know, how much information you're losing, and on the other hand, the benefit you're getting by reducing the size of the alphabet in terms of your ability to estimate, given the limited amount of data that you have. Uh, but the other issue that you mentioned is indeed uh, maybe more significant, right, which is that you know, so, something like mutual information doesn't care about how close right, the two, two possible values are. Only whether, you know, if you quantize, if they're different, then it doesn't matter if they're you know, here and here versus here and here. It's just two different values. Uh, and so probably you know, in, in situations uh, of this type, you, there might be more effective, effective uh, ways of, of estimating even things like mutual information. Uh, but I guess here the point was um, that even if you don't take this into account, you can do some significant, you know, you can do some significant inference. Um, I think, uh, let's again, uh, in, in the context of financial data, as far as I'm aware, the way that this has been used was again, to try to, let's say if you have a multitude of, of signals, to try to detect which of them is perhaps, or which subset of them is perhaps most relevant to you know, a signal that you care to predict. And in a pretty sort of um, you know, heuristic fashion, you, I mean, but you employ something like this separately on each pair to detect the right subset, and then you do, you do other things that do care about, say, a loss function of relevance for the financial application. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.